Agile FM, radio for the Agile community. Hi everyone, I'm uh, back with another episode in the Agile Kata series. Um, we're going to explore the topic of culture and learning and how that relates to Kata and scientific thinking. And today I have Katie Anderson with me, who wrote the book, Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn, Lessons from Toyota leader Isao Yoshino on a lifetime of continuous learning. And there's a lot of words in it that are relating straight with Kata. Katie, you have been on this uh, podcast before. We talked uh, more in depth about the book. This is a little bit more in depth about Kata and how it relates to your book that doesn't mention the word Kata, but there are so many connections and synergies. We got to explore that area a little bit, but first and foremost, welcome. Thanks, Joe. It's great to be back and uh, dive into this conversation with you. I'm so passionate about how as individuals, leaders, we create learning in our organizations and the, the patterns and routines about how we do problem solving and code for problem solving is just so fundamental mm -hmm. to that. Absolutely. Now, I have to admit, I listened to your book recently, the audio version of it. And in the, so I was listening in, in all aspects of life, uh, but then it all came together in the last chapter when you summarized learnings, right? The learnings from the book and, and summarized. And the word kata wasn't mentioned in the book, but it just screamed kata everywhere. And I was like, I have to have K Katie on the show again. And we need to talk about this because it is about continuous learning. It is about failure. It is about, what is it? Failing or falling seven times and getting up eight times while and things like that. So all of those characteristics you're mentioning in the book are important. Did Isao ever mention the word kata in your conversations? So no, and actually when Mike Rother's book came out and it was a little bit before I met Mr. Yoshino, but we has caught the term Toyota Kata and the word Kata mm -hmm. actually means something in Japanese. It's the routines and practices that support something usually used in martial arts. And the way Mike Rother used it was around how do we create learn habits of learning, the patterns mm -hmm. that we go through for problem solving and coaching for problem solving. And in the English language, that's now become ubiquitous with with. Kata means that around problem solving. Mr. Yoshino, though, it, there isn't something called Toyota Kata. It's what Mike Rother and other researchers, when they went to Toyota to observe what was happening, trying to undercover that, uncover that secret sauce, mm. they, he observed this pattern of how leaders and managers were showing up to help people go through a problem solving process. And he said, there is this unspoken or undocumented routine that people are doing. And if you read my book, you will see from Mr. Yoshino's 40 years at working at Toyota. So we cover from the late sixties to the early two thousands, right. all of his experiences about how to learn how to problem solve and then how to coach other people through problem solving, go through this same format. How are you asking really effective questions? How are you guiding people through a learning process and not coming up with the answers? How are you setting the direction, providing support, and then also continuing to develop yourself as a coach and a leader as well? So the reason I didn't use the word Kata or Toyota Kata in the book was because it didn't exist at the time. There wasn't that label that we now have in, at the time that Mr. Yoshino was in Japan or in yeah. Toyota. And the book itself was called Toyota Kata because of publishing, not necessarily something that is like a tool that was developed from no, absolutely. So I take people to uh, Japan on my executive Japan study trips and I'll, I'll have people in the past. I've had different participants say, are we going to see Toyota boards up at Toyota? And I'm like, no, no, you won't. Because this was a framework that was developed to help us outside of Toyota, outside of Japan, to learn the pattern, to practice mm -hmm. the kata, the routines that support this. And so then there, there are a variety of tools that can help us do that, but they don't, that's not what exists at Toyota, but that pattern of yeah. the mindset and the behaviors exist. But their Toyota leaders are not walking around with the five question card and going through this. That's a tool to help us learn that pattern that's inherent. I open the book, you'll remember this, Joe, a, a quote from Mr. Yoshino from early days when I was interviewing him half a decade ago. He said, the only secret to Toyota is its attitude towards learning. And that's exactly what Mike Rother was documenting and Jeff Liker and others and Jim Womack and so many people, they were documenting and seeing this attitude towards learning, but it's really hard to describe that, right? right? It's easier to see the tools and the outputs of it. Yeah. So this is very interesting, right? Because you actually in that chapter, right? In, in that final chapter of your book, you do mention words like 
setting the direction a challenge personally or for the organization or as, as a team is, is uh, important. Experimentation uh, is important. And now within the book, there is, I want to take the entire book away. There's a ton of things to be explored, but there is an example of a failed experiment, a very costly failed experiment from Mr. Yoshino. And that is from a Kara's perspective, obviously an experiment that failed at, at a large scale, right? And a big learning. I would assume would come out of this exploring no business ideas within an organization, but even on smaller scales, I'm, I'm sure there were tons of uh, experiments going on in his life and what you have observed, obviously working with the organization or with him directly. How important is that from a learnings perspective, that experimentation piece? It's fundamental, right? The reason we don't know the answer is is because we don't have the answer yet. And so we need to know directionally, where are we trying to get to? and then learn our way forward. And so a lot of, if you take away the, the terminology, so much of what you learn through reading this book and from my conversations with Mr. series are those same patterns. Like, how do you set a target, but doesn't, don't worry about it being too precise. You'll learn your way forward as you start doing the experiments. It's about how do you ask those questions? How are you go through the process of learning? You'll remember there's a story where Mr. Yoshino was asked to put together a report and a document and his boss, who had asked him to do this, when he went forward to present, he said, what was the process that you took to prepare this report? And he knew he should have gone out and actually done interviews, gone to the quote unquote Gemba, and said he went to the library because he didn't feel like he had time. And the boss oh, yeah. said, no, that's not the right process for the learning. And so it's that same model in the Kata, the Kata world or Kata framework that you want to coach people through the process of learning. And not necessarily giving them the answer, but giving them the framework and the structure to be learning their way forward to that answer as well, or to a new answer that you don't even have, right? Oftentimes we're in these complex environments. We're not just giving people assignments for learning their way to a, a set predetermined answer. It's about yeah. learning our way forward to innovation and to continuous improvement. I remember that, that scene in the book. And that was also, it was interesting for me coming from an, an agile and from an cutter's uh, perspective. One thing was in, in that particular dialogue, I remember it crystal clear now that after you said it is probably not enough research was done on the existing current condition, right? So like, where are we right now in, in terms of the process? It was just not enough to read about it and go to the library. So one of those learnings, right? And that is the scientific thinking of Kata to say, step back, slow down yes. with, with where you are in, even in your learning journey, that, that's a key aspect yep. of this one. Absolutely. I want to emphasize too, that like kata, as we, that using that term kata, it's mm -hmm. nothing different. So it's not separate from like how we approach continuous improvement, how we approach the scientific method. It is the routines and practices that help us get there. Damn. And so there's people in the wor lean world or the agile world. And honestly, it doesn't, what we label it, those are like the tools and the processes, but the fundamental thinking yeah. and human behavior aspects are yeah. all interrelated there too. And so again, Kata is just those routines and practices that help enable us to be better problem solvers and better coaches of problem solving. Yeah. I always refer to it as a universal pattern rather than mm. a tool. It could be described as a tool, but sometimes people feel like a tool is like a, like an actual thing, a tangible thing. It's a yeah. think, it's a thinking pattern in my opinion that most likely gets you through scientific thinking. And if we can agree on that scientific thinking is a good idea, it's a good idea. Yep. Right? Yes, absolutely. So there are tools that support that. You can have a kind of storyboard or a question card that helps you practice, but it's the same thing with anything like learning a sport or so you have tools that help you practice that pattern and that routine. So it becomes habitual. Right. And it's second, second nature of what you do. And then said, so therefore you don't need the cards anymore. I think right. that's a, that's an important thing. Now, what you just described, this is also something I found as a quote, be patient. It takes time to develop people and accomplish challenges. And that was one of those things I carved out. And I think that plays very well with what you just said. It's even though it cut up the routines, the questions, it might be simple. There might be a card. There's a starting point. It's not a quick fix. No. <laughs> Why is that to establish, uh, a learning culture, like to stay here on topic for culture and learning and everything. What, what makes this so, like, yeah. it's so fundamentally simple, but it is so hard to do. So patience becomes an important thing. Absolutely. It's a long-term, it's a long-term way creating new habits. It does take time. 
And we, and I talk about this a lot in recent episodes on my own podcast, Chain of Learning, we are caught in this like doing trap opposed to the being trap. We get very focused on the achievements, the goals, the outcomes that we need. Mm-hmm. And not that we don't have this vision that we want to be someone who's taking the time to ask the questions to coach, but we just get stuck in this focus on the outcomes and the doing. Mm-hmm. And so we can take a step back and say, actually, when we do slow down to ask more questions, to help other people learn how to solve problems, we collectively, we actually will ultimately get there faster because we're going to have better ideas. We're going to have more clarity on what's the real problem we're even trying to solve. And then the creative input of people on how to get there. So we'll come up with better ideas as well. And so we just are in this, we get this short fix cycle, vicious cycle where the practices of the kata really can help us slow down and remind our, remind us to mm-hmm. ask those questions have we clearly defined a target? Do we really know what that next step is? Have we defined what the gap is? What are the next steps we're ta- doing? And just get us into that pattern opposed to just jumping to solutions or to action when we really don't even know where we need to go. And, and also to frame things as experiments. I think that's a really important part of this is framing everything that we're doing as an experiment. If we do this thing, what do we expect to happen? And then it gives us a place to come back and say, what do we learn from that? And how is that helping us move forward? And I, that, I think let's stay with this experimentation piece for a second, because I also think that's a cultural thing, right? So yeah. we, where I have observed that failure in an organization of an experiment is very often has a negative association with it, right? Within the business world, not so much within laboratories. And so I would assume or this, that's not my, that's not my expertise, but it's not very common to have a culture within organizations to foster. Like, so when you're saying like. I don't know if I quote this right here for seven times, get up eight, how many people can fail for seven times within an organization without ramifications within an organization. So mm-hmm. how important is that from a leadership's perspective? And obviously Saru Yoshida was part of a leadership team to create a culture like that. So that experimentation is happening and not, not tolerated, but encouraged, right? And also the failed experiments that go along with it potentially. Yeah, there's so, there's so many different ways I could start going into that framing of that. But absolutely, so starting with absolutely moving from a culture of blame to a culture that embraces failure as a source of learning is critical. Mm-hmm. So if we're looking at the process and not blaming the person. Second, it's about making sure that our experiments are not so like they were doing micro experiments so that the failures then are, are more of a micro level, right? Opposed mm-hmm. to... Sometimes we do so much planning, planning for this massive thing and we haven't done any tests of along the way. And so then it's much more the impact of a failure is so much bigger at that end, rather than if we had done some micro tests along the way and having that learning. And I think in our culture, we do, we put so much emphasis on the planning side, um, the plan and the do, and we don't have as much of that study and reflect. And so because of that planning, then we're taking action. But if we fail on that, it's so much bigger. And so then it feels more catastrophic. And of course, we don't want people getting hurt, things happening. Like we don't, we need, but those are bad. Those are really bad failures. And that's hugely problematic. And we should have been doing better tests of change before that. But even as you you mentioned earlier in this episode that Mr. Yoshino was in charge of this large new business venture that ended up costing Toyota tens of thousands of dollars when it failed. But also you have to be willing to run those experiments because if, you're, if you want to create innovation in your organization, you have to be willing to take the risk. You don't know if something's going to succeed or not. And so they also knew that they, Mr. Cho, who was the president of Toyota at the time, said to Mr. Yish, you were some things you tried. We gave you a mission and you did your best and thank you. And the Toyota too, there were some things, the management decisions that impacted the business venture not working out. It wasn't just the result of one person. Yeah. So that's super important from an organizational standpoint as well. Yeah. It's also leadership, right? To have a challenge for a team or an individual to be able to experiment within certain boundaries, right? And be safe and knowing what the challenges are and have a, have a direction when it's right. just experimenting for the sake of experimenting. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and and the, the leader's job is to set up the working conditions for people to be successful. And so that's part of their role. What are the, the structures and conditions that allow people to do their best work and to learn along the way? Yeah. It was also interesting for everybody listening to this from a lean's perspective, like this plan, do, check, act kind of cycle would be part of each of those experiments that would be taking place within the cutter, within the pattern. You will find 
lean concepts in what we're talking about here as a general thinking process. What's also interesting was the words you used throughout your entire book about learner and coach and coachee or learner in this environment, because that is all, when I started reading or listening to the book, I was like always reminded, this is about learning. This is not about a manager and a subordinate. It's about a learner from a cultural perspective. Mm-hmm. And that obviously links directly to Kata as well, where there is a learner and there's a coach. From an agile perspective, the learner could be a group of people uh, mm-hmm. rather than a single person. How important was that in your conversations and by writing the book and what you have learned since the book was published that this, the constant reminder of that we're learners in a day-to-day practice of improvement. That's so interesting. It, you haven't, I haven't thought about that terminology. That's something I think I brought in more in terms of describing you know, Mr. Yoshino when he, ta- he does talk about being a manager and a subordinate. And those are just terms that they use. But because this pattern was already embedded into their ethos of how they are, that, that terminology doesn't matter. It does matter more for us. And so yeah. I was really intentional when I was writing the book about how can I translate these 40 years of Toyota and experience in a way that's really going to resonate and connect with people in our generation who didn't grow up in the Toyota world to understand the real meaning behind things. And so I, the word learner and, and coach are, are, those are really important to me. It really emphasize that this is all about the only secret to Toyota is its attitude towards learning. And so yeah. how do we stay in that mindset? And so the words that we use can really be helpful in mm. keeping that for, in the forefront. Yeah. What was interesting though, was that the, the roles shifted with throughout the book, right? So sometimes we saw him being a, a learner versus a Yes. A coach, right? So we, we saw the, the change of the roles, which was fascinating. And that is also what we have in an agile, in a kata environment all the time. So. Absolutely. And that's where, how I came up with the title of learning to lead, leading to learn. And it's, it's a cyclical situation because mm-hmm. you're always, if you have the learning to lead with a first thing, you learn to do this, learn to practice the kata routine, mm-hmm. lead, learn how to be a leader, how to be a manager, how to be an agile practitioner, all of those things. But you also need to lead with an attitude towards learning. And then mm-hmm. as Mr. Chino said too, he was always learning how to be a better leader at the same time. And so we're never stopping learning. We're just in different roles. Sometimes we're the one being mentored or coached yeah. and other times we're doing that coaching or we're in teams and we're like doing it all together. Yeah, so it is. And that's where that concept of that chain of learning, it's actually mm-hmm. a phrase that Mr. Yoshino said to me about how he felt so grateful to be joining Toyota. This is in his early years in his twenties, joining a company that really, emphasize this chain of learning. How are we all learners and leaders together helping improve and grow and become better people, solve more problems? And that's, that was really an inspiration for my podcast title too, because how do we all, we're all connected in that way. Yeah. And we are connected through Kata, through your book, through the work we're doing, through Agile FM and through your podcast. This is Absolutely. awesome, Katie. Uh, I want to thank you for some of your thoughts and also bringing thinking to everybody who has read your book and maybe listens to this podcast is, oh, yes, I've listened to Kata and this is the connection to it. Yes. Right? But also for everybody in the Agile community say, wow, man, like maybe I can use the basic pattern of Kata to improve my role within the organization, right? So I myself have worked with Agile coaches that are using Kata for improving their own personal development within an organization. And then they're using it also for teams to improve for high performance. So the sky is the limit, apparently. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. It's the pattern. It's the pattern of problem solving. It's the pattern of innovate, how we create innovation. And it's the pattern of how we help each other get better at getting better. Yeah. And so no matter what you call it, just practice the routines and the patterns. It's going to help you no matter what your industry is, what your, the focus of your work is, whatever challenge you're moving towards. Mm-hmm. These routines and patterns are just so transformational. Yeah. Katie, you mentioned it already. There is a podcast out there you have, The Chain of Learning. There is a website that is at kbjanderson.com. Yes. And, uh, but if somebody just Googles the title of your book, Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn, they will find you as well. Yes. So thank you for coming back on the show and uh, do that kind of special with me. With thank them. you. Thanks, Joe. It's a pleasure. <laughs>